Welcome to the webinar, everyone. We are so excited to have you here today. Um, I appreciate you at the beginning of the school um, being here with us. Um, we are talking about this series, Rose and I are going to be talking about two areas that we both are just truly passionate about. Um, I get to kick off the series with one of um, my favorite area, emergent writing. So um, this is the series. Um, so today we're doing um, emergent writing. Um, next week, it'll be building sentences. Um, the following week is um, dictate and organize ideas and compose and type with grammar support. So our hope is that we, through the series, will give you um, lots of tools to have in your toolbox to work with students from that very emergent level mm -hmm. of writing to all the way up to um, conventional um, writing, multiple, multiple paragraph kind of work. So that's kind of um, what this series is all about. And I'll start, I'll introduce myself. I'm Heidi Brislin. I'm an occupational therapist by training. I am an AT specialist for um, SETSI and for the Edmonds School District. I've been in the schools for 21 years. Um, this is my 21st year. Um, and my passions about writing are creating opportunities so that every child sees themselves as a writer, that we approach writing using a developmental framework for our students who are unable to hold a pencil or for all of our students, but especially those who cannot hold a pencil and that we make writing accessible and fun with just the right amount of silliness. <laughs> and um, I, I have a lot of fun published, helping kids publish their writing. Awesome, thanks Heidi. My name is Rose Roscoe. I'm also an occupational therapist uh, and an AT specialist. And this year I'm only working for the Special Ed Tech Center, but I have 35 years of experience in school district practice, both as an OT and AT specialist. And um, Heidi and I are both passionate about writing, but as it turns out, uh, she loves to emphasize kind of the earlier part of emergent writing, and I'm really passionate about the UDL opportunity um, of writing with higher level students. So we'll be, um, you know, both participating in, in all the sessions, but she's going to be leading uh, two of them, and I'll be leading the other two as the main thing. And my passions about writing are really thinking within the universal design for learning framework about how do we front load writing options for all students to succeed. And like Heidi, I really like to figure out ways to make writing fun and engaging. Um, you know, there are low tech ways, but of course I've, I have a lot of cool high tech ideas or mid to high tech ideas for making writing fun. Um, how can we remove barriers to writing and give kids choices? And then um, when we do ask kids to write, how can we make it meaningful to them so they want to write? And like Heidi said, publish something that um, they want to share with their family and friends. And then um, getting creative and really trying out some innovative uh, tools to find the right fit for every student. So that's me. And I will just say to you with our, our series of four classes, um, today we're a little heavy because we have a lot of intro, you know, foundational stuff, but we really want to give you at least 20 minutes up to 30 minutes of time for interacting, sharing your experiences. We want to hear from you because um, I'm sure you all have a lot of writing tools and tricks that you're already using. So we're here to learn from each other as well as uh, present ideas from Heidi and I. So thanks. For sure. Okay, so express yourself looking at those emergent writers. So the objectives of the series are that, you, are that you'll be able to compare and analyze tools and strategies so that students can express themselves um, and be able to share your experiences with writers at various levels and be able to implement at least one new tool or strategy that you um, have a student who might be struggling with. Okay, so we're going to go into a little bit of some of like what the research says and we're going to talk about typically developing writers, because um, I think we need to kind of build a foundation of kind of where we're hoping to go and where our students are. Um, so this quote really um, speaks to me from this research article that kindergartners who are typically developing are from middle-class homes and are exposed to literacy from infancy, interformal schooling, 
with more than a thousand hours of early literacy experiences. That's a lot. So think about our students with special needs coming in to our schools in kindergarten. You know, they haven't had this many hours. For, for many of our, our kids who, um, who might have some complex learning needs, whether they have a complex body or um, they have, um, they're dealing with autism or some other kind of just learning um, and attentional challenge issues. Um, the parents, a lot of times I know for like the medically fragile kids are, are just doing their best to kind of keep their kids clean, safe and alive, clean, fed and alive. And, you know, being able to sit down and do that shared reading often is really challenging to kind of find that time. Um, and it's the same for all of our other parents. They're, they're just trying to get through the day. So our kids come to us with a clear disadvantage. They don't have those literacy experiences that typically that their typically developing peers have. Um, when we look at um, emergent literacy, um, I want to look through, uh, I want to talk about comprehensive literacy instruction, and that's, we're going to do a quick overview. I'm not sure if you have not done the book study comprehensive literacy for all. There's a couple places you can do that. Setsi's um, YouTube channel has a series. We've run the webinar a couple of times. There is a comprehensive literacy for all Facebook group that they're running their fourth series. Um, so those are some, some ways, and these are my buddies. This is um, Hermie and Finley, so they're my study buddies. Um, so when we're looking at um, comprehensive emergent literacy instruction, we're looking at shared reading, shared writing, predictable, um, shared writing, which looks at some predictable chart writing, um, alphabet and phonological awareness, independent reading and independent writing. And so looking at ways to give um, the students we work with opportunities to experience um, all of these, like they're typically developing peers. So when Karen Erickson and when I say, Rose and I say all, all really means all. And this quote from Erin Sheldon, who's a mom, is um, just so powerful. If we don't assume that every child in this inclusive classroom is potentially literate and that it is our job to teach them literacy, then what we actually communicate to all of the kids in the class is that this is a friend who visits us and all the rest of us are doing the work of learning. Hmm. Go Can I throw out a comment? Yes. I just want to say another experience I've had, sometimes, you know, our students haven't had that exposure. Other times they've had all the exposure, but they haven't had opportunity to do the expression part, right? That's mm -hmm. why we're here today because um, number one, we absolutely have to make sure they get exposed to that literacy, just like Heidi's saying, but also part of that literacy is expression. And sometimes that's the hardest part because how do we unlock and give them those opportunities? So that's where Heidi really shines. I'm excited to hear more today. Oh, thank you, Rose. <laughs> okay, so this is where a lot of special ed teams are across the country. So you have your silos, you have your general ed teacher, your special ed teacher, um, your teacher for the visually impaired, your speech therapist, your OTPT, there might be various, um, the paraeducators, um, I think I had a silo for them once upon a time, but I'm not sure if I switched it to TBI. Um, but those are all part of this team and are all crucial to helping this child that we are supporting meet their educational goals. And so if we're off in our silos, um, we're not gonna, the student is not gonna make nearly as much progress um, as they would if we were collaborating together. So who is part of this comprehensive literacy team? Well, the students first and foremost, and them having a say in what they're interested in writing about um, and those kind of things is very important. Um, the special ed teacher, um, the gen ed teacher, teacher for the visually impaired, paras, I kind of went through this already, and the parents. So both, you know, everyone is as important as in this team as the other. 
And if you look at, um, I'm not sure what discipline everybody is here from. I know we have um, some speech therapists and some OTs, but I'm not sure if any of you have seen this um, joint statement in our profession. Um, Interprofessional Collaborative Goal Writing for School-Based Practice, our professional organizations say, get out of that silo. We all need to be working on the student's goals. And so I'm going to pop this open quick. And I'm going to just show you an example of, you can read it on your own, it's linkable there. But here's like a collaborative goal writing process. So here's, you know, the educational impact is they're having difficulty completing more than 10% of a written page. Um, then their present levels we're talking about, their sitting, their fine motor skills, um, following instructions, um, sensory. And then we come up with a, a collaborative goal. And this goal isn't about self-regulation or fine motor skills or sitting tolerance. It's really about what is the activity we want the child to do. We want them to go from 10% of completing this written paper, doing 10% of it, to doing 50% of it in the same amount of time. And so what are we going to do to, how is the goal going to be addressed? We've got PTs going to work on maybe adaptive seating or incorporating some strengthening activities or movement breaks to kind of help with that sitting balance. Um, looks like there's a typo here. Um, OT is going to look at assistive technology support, um, work with the teachers on self-regulation, visual supports, um, quiet spaces for working, sequencing materials, organizing materials. The SLP is going to work on all those receptive language activities that are nece necessary to do written expression. Um, and then the gen ed teacher is going to develop grade level appropriate activities that can be modified so that they can do that. And the special ed teacher is going to implement the instruction related to literacy development. So this is pretty powerful. Um, so I recommend all of you look at that. Um, can you just give me in the chat whether you've seen it before or not, or is this the first time seeing it? I don't see anybody responding yet, but I can monitor and let you know. Okay, thanks. I do. All right. So I'm this is disabled. Pardon me? Chat is disabled? Oh, oh is We're it? Not able to put anything in. Two people raise their hands. So you guys maybe speak really quick and I'll see if I can figure out how to give you chat permission. Sorry about that. All right, Pamela or Angela, either one of you had your hand up, I think. I had not seen it before and this is really exciting to me, especially with the groups I do with speech and the special ed teacher and that kind of thing. I'll be looking this up, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's powerful. You know, when you have those teams that are not, you know, are still kind of stuck in, let's write our discipline specific goals. You've got the, you know, we're doing evidence-based practice and this is what our professional organizations are telling us. That's pretty powerful. All right, anybody else have a comment? So I have worked um, in both my silo and I have worked, I'm gonna call it in my salad. <laughs> um, and I can tell you when we move from working on individual discipline specific goals and create these interdisciplinary student goals, we create something that is just beautiful and amazing. You know, so, Definitely looking at, oh, you can do a Q&A, have never seen it. Okay, so if you want to answer, if you want to ask questions, you can put it in Q&A. That is enabled. Let me get everything moved over here. And Rose says she fixed the chat. Yay. Yay, all right. First webinar of the year for us. So, so a couple of things when you're looking at literacy for like written expression and just a variety of things, I want to let you know that the Special Ed Tech Center has a low tech literacy kit that you can check out. Um, and it works, it has like an alternative pencil here to work on emergent writing. It has um, these um, pocket charts so you can build um, words with them or build sentences, you know, when you're talking about a story. 
it has some voice output buttons. They're really awesome. Um, and then once you get one, they're they're pretty easy to to you know look at and be like, oh, I can make these. So, and then going along with the um, the literacy kit, um, there is a handout with QR codes that tell you how to work on comprehension, how to work on first letter, um, phonemic awareness, vocabulary. There is a link to um, the Go Talk Now pages that Brenda Del Monte has um, created where, that she uses with her students. And if you have Go Talk Now on your iPad and you scan the QR, they upload right into Go Talk. So that's a you know awesome option there. So if you're interested, um, check out the lending library and check those out. And so now I'm going to start on what do we need to do for our emergent writers? So let's talk about teaching yes and no. So yes and no is a must. So um, I just did the movement for communication um, with Gail Porter and Claire Cotter and Linda Burkhart in Chicago. And there are a couple people on the um, webinar today who were there with me. And um, I think for me that you, you don't wait for these kids to show you what their yes, no is. You're going to teach them what their yes, no is. You're going to find the movement that works and you're going to start modeling it and teaching it. Um, it may take a while for the student to master. It may not be something that happens right away. But when you look at when it for a child to start to use these motor skills, they are juggling all of their sensory processing um, abilities, their motor skills, their cognitive, their social, emotional, their language skills are going to process what you said. So there's a lot going on to be able to accurately initiate and execute this movement. So keep modeling, 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 just like with the AAC, and you will get something for most kids that is close to a conventional yes, no, it could be eyebrows up, um, you know, head down. So it could be a, a variety of things, but I always try to go for a conventional yes, no, as much as I can. And then practice using engaging, fun, silly activities. So that neural pathway will be strengthened and that, um, the um, movement becomes more automatic. So, you know, I, I always kind of say that, you know, we're starting with, you know, we're starting with like dental floss, you know, and we want to work to building that pathway to be a rope. So it's like automatic. So the more you teach, the more you model, um, the stronger that neural pathway is going to be. Um, and it requires modeling in context when you're doing something that's yes or no, or, um, when you're, you know, when you're doing things where you're making a choice and you can model like, gosh, I don't know if for lunch, I want, you know, pizza or spaghetti. Hmm. Let me think about it. No, I don't want pizza. Yes. I'm going to get spaghetti today. So you're modeling it in the context of what you might say yes or no for. And then one of my big takeaways from that course I was at was, you know, looking at teaching them with self-talk. Our self-talk is so important and we all have it. Um, and sometimes it's not our best friend, but if we can start working with our students and start teaching them some self-talk that helps them be able to control their body, um, it's gonna give them so much power and so much more independence. So you can say, and while you're modeling, you can say, I am moving my head from side to side to say no. And then the same thing for yes, but always use that I terminology. So that's the self-talk that's, um, you know, come in. And when you see them do it, say, wow, I saw you move your head back and forth. You're telling me no, you know, that's awesome. So those are just some, that's, I can't tell you for every child who cannot communicate, this is so important and everybody can work on it. And down here at the bottom, I have a link to a handout with lot that we have at Setsi with lots of activities to teach yes and no. Any questions about yes and no? All right. I don't see any. So the other thing that's really important is you and your like immediate team may have figured out what the students yes, no looks like. But what happens when you have a sub? And I know the last few years we've had lots and lots of subs. 
So if you create a yes, no chart, and that kind of just goes in your sub notes um, or your team sub notes, you, or it hangs up in the classroom as well, then you know, like, do they need any prompting? Do they need a tactile? Um, yes, we can send the participants the link to the handout. I will work on that here in a minute. Um, but this is a, a way that, you know, helps everybody know. So you have the right way, you know, everybody's like on board for how that child communicates. All right, writing components. Here, I can stop and share that. Rose, do you have access to the handout to share it? Yes, I just wrote in the Q&A that I'll do that for you. No worries. Okay, perfect. Uh -huh. Okay, um, so the components of writing are form and function. Anybody have an idea where in the schools we tend to get stuck? You can unmute or you can put it in the chat. Where do you think we get unstuck? Where we get stuck? Form, Shannon and Melissa, form. We get stuck on the form. So how the writing looks, how it's created, and then that actually follows function and development. So if our kids have not been exposed to the function of writing and they come into kindergarten and we jump right into form, we're not following normal development. So that's, you know, definitely, um, you know, a place that special ed in general, not just your OTs, it's like everybody kind of goes focusing on form. So the function, with the function, we're gonna teach them why you write. Um, and there is a whole developmental progression that we'll talk about a little bit more here in a second that begins with scribbling. And I always share this story that my daughter had like pages and pages and pages of scribbling. Um, and then eventually you start to see shapes and letters and picture drawings and stuff. So, um, so what we need to do is change our focus to teaching function and choose a pencil that allows the brain power for function. So not all of our kids can hold a pencil. So what kind of alternative pencil are we gonna choose for them? So, um, and I wanna say this, I'm gonna say it loud and proud. Some of you may not agree with me, but this is what the research says, that writing is not copying and tracing. That is not teaching you how to write. Copying and tracing are fine motor tasks that do not facilitate the process of writing. They just work on the form. Um, we need to be teaching our kids that print has meaning and people, why people write and what it means to be a writer and how to think like a writer. And copying and tracing is just busy work. It doesn't teach those things. So what does emergent look, writing look like? This is what emergent writing looks like. It is scribbling and making marks all over the page. It is using an alternative pencil to, um, you know, compose text. It is playing with alphabet um, manipulatives. Could be like this jumping thing on a playground and you're jumping back and forth from the letters. That is what emergent writing is. And this is hyperlinked right here. So if you wanna get, uh, so you can see it a little bit better. Um, but this is, and I'm not gonna go over the whole thing, but these are the developmental stages of writing that typically developing kids go through. So our emergent, our emergent writers who are unable to hold a pencil, using an alternative pencil allows them to go through that preliterate stage, the emergent stage, transitional, and eventually get to a fluent stage. Rose, do you have something to say? I do. Um, I was just, I'm going to talk about this next session more, but um, I did a research study years ago when I got my master's and the kids I started with were scribblers and just in this very early symbolic scribbling and just a few letter stages. So when given assistive technology, we can enable them to move through this. Thing. You don't. So we're going to talk about why you won't limit a student just to paper and pencil. It's still great. Have them scribble, have them handle tools, have them try all those other methods. But but then don't stop there. If they get stuck somewhere, that's where we have to start layering in other kinds of supports that will allow them to start 
working on sentence structure and sequencing and punctuation, whether they can write all the letters of the words or not, the computer can help them. So that's my little, um, one of my soapbox things we'll talk more about next session. Nice. And I had a little guy once that he sat down on the computer, who's a kindergartner, and he filled a page with like random letters. We printed it off and I had him sit in my author chair and I said, can you read it to me? Tell me what you said. Tell me what you wrote. And it was like this most amazing, like pirate story that, you know, just was like let, a bunch of letters. And I'm like, that is so awesome. Let's put it on my bulletin board. So that's how you teach them the function of writing. You, you, you respond to what they've written instead of like, that's just a bunch of letters. I can't read any of them, which I know none of you would say. Um, but I think a lot of times when they scribble and just, whether it's on text, on tech or with, on paper, like, hey, what did you say? Um, I want to share this with you because this has been a new find for me and it is something I am super, super excited about. So it is J Jane Farrell's um, writing with all tools continuum. And so it's a way to look at um, writing samples. So it goes from marks to sentence fragments. So it helps you write some goals here. So you know, and it talks about regardless of what writing tool they use, whether they're using alphabet letters that are manipulatives, or they're using a pencil, or they're using an alternative pencil or a keyboard. But it goes from part one, going from marks to sentence fragments. Um, and it has, you know, there's how many levels in this? Six levels. So it kind of is a good way to... So um, use this to, when you're doing writing samples, say, oh, okay, my student started um, at A4, and now they're down here to A6. And so it gives you descriptive words that talk about what it looks like. So you can better look at those emergent writers and come up with ways to monitor progress. And then there's um, grouping letters and spaces. So it goes all the way up to conventional writing. And we'll be looking at this throughout this, the future sessions as well. So this is kind of the introduction today. Um, and I'm, is, isn't she like have an assessment that she's just putting out there for people to try right now? So this is brand new and there's a guide. And then I thought she has, has an assessment. Is this the assessment? They're, oh. they're both in the resources at the end. So there is this, the writing tools continuum is like the tool. And then there's one that has like all these samples of work. Mm -hmm. So you can see where they're at at different levels. And then there's one um, that she's done is how to, how to move them from one step to the next. And so just a powerful, powerful tool that I'm just so thrilled about. Mm -hmm. Um, and writing development happens because of literacy experiences, us attributing meaning to their scribbling, um, emergent writing opportunities, um, and students with disabilities need more of these writing opportunities. And then if you think about it, it takes three to three and a half years for a typically developing child to develop from emergent to early conventional um, writers. It's going to take our students, many of them, a lot longer than that. So something, just keep working on it. Um, so do you guys have any experiences you want to share with um, us about your work with emergent writers? You should all have permission to speak if you want to unmute yourself, but I will check to make sure I didn't miss anybody. So you can go in the chat or unmute if you want to chat. Do other people find this group really hard to figure out what to do with? Hi, this is Barb. Hi, um, Barb. Hi. Uh, and, um, and I'm retired, so this was from a few years ago. But um, I had a student who um, was just really interested in, in looking at books and looking at text, um, but didn't. It, didn't have a, a um a really strong way to communicate and um, i know you're going to be talking about um alternative pencils but um for him that really opened the door to him 
really engaging meaningfully with the writing process in a way that just blew my socks off. It's a very powerful tool, Barb. It's, I've seen some super exciting things happen with that. Anybody else? Hi, this is Margaret. And um, one of the things I have some students with Down syndrome that I work with and trying to get them to create ideas um, of what to write is sometimes difficult. And so I usually contact their parents and have them send me pictures of that particular student doing something, whether it be on vacation, whether it's something they do with their family, even as simple as riding a bike. And they find that very exciting because then I put it up on the whiteboard or project it. And first of all, they're so excited to see themselves. Um, but second of all, they it helps them with those emergent ideas on what to write about. That is awesome. I know um, there was, I think it might've been Karen Erickson's conference at ATIA right before the world shut down. Um, and she talked about putting together like a photo album, like your writing book. And so you could flip through it and they could either give you yes and no's about what they wanted to write with. It was full of like, you know, pictures from you know, family or pictures of things they were interested in. And so that is a great, those are, those visuals are just a really good way to kind of get them started. Okay. In the chat, tell me if you've ever used an alternative pencil. We got Barb is a yes. That mean everyone else is a rose is limited. Okay. Yes. Okay. Awesome, Stacy. The eye gaze, perfect. Shannon is yes. Okay, you guys are making me happy. All right, so this is multiple alternative pencils here. They come in different, you can print them out in different colors. Um, it was developed by Gretchen Hanser at the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies at the University of Chap North Carolina Chapel Hill, the Tar Hills. And um, it's defined as anything that provides students with access to um, all 26 letters of the alphabet. So who are they for? Um, they were created for students who can typically can, are unable to hold a traditional pencil or um, physically manipulate a standard keyboard. Um, they can also be used with writers of varying ages and abilities, um, including students who are emergent writers and are able to write more conventionally, but they're just, they, they're, they, they don't like writing. Um, so I've, I've used that as a way to kind of get some of my non-writers who are capable of writing um, started um, so that it's not so painful, so that then we can get some of their ideas out. Um, the link here takes you to the site where you can actually download the um, templates for the alternative pencil. Um, but an alternative pencil can be anything. It can be the alphabet on the back of a core board, the um, alphabet on their AAC device. It could be alphabet on an iPad. Um, I even say like the alphabet strip. Um, on the desk can be an alternative pencil. So you work first on teaching that yes and no. Um, we talked, Margaret, we talked about finding a topic of interest. Um, and when a student's given all 26 letters of the alphabet, um, we give them all 26 and that is powerful. So then they can, you know, you kind of work like, you kind of work like their um, word prediction engine. You're the word prediction engine. Um, so, I have a friend who is an adult who's gone to college and she has an ACE, a high-tech AAC system, and her preferred method to communicate is an alphabet board on her tray. And her communication partner, she moves her hand across and her communication partner does her word prediction and she's fast. Um, and 
you know, when I asked her why use this instead of that, and she's like, well, when I have my AAC device, when I'm trying to compose my response, the conversation goes on without me. But if I'm using my alphabet board, there, um, my communication partner is staying right there with me and I get to stay engaged in the conversation. So, you know, that kind of gave me a, a, you know, was a big aha moment for me. Um, and if you're, um, and if you're working with an emergent writer on the flip charts or anything, you would, you would basically start with each letter. Um, and then you might say, is it this one? Is it that one? Is it, the, is it on this, is in this row and then go through each one. So there's a variety of, of things to do there. So the student chooses the letter they want, whether they know the letter or not. So you're gonna say, is it an A? And if they nod their head, you're gonna write an A. Um, and for them to, we just um, started using this in a program we're doing in Edmonds and we, mo we modeled it for our teams and the kids are tickled that you're actually writing down what they say. Um, so what I'll do is, oh, you picked an A, A says, ah, you know, and then you just, and you always go back to A for those emergent um, writers, because typically you'll see strings of alphabet letters in order. Um, so, and I read the letters back. And so if we have a whole page of A's, you know, maybe we were writing about a cat, you know, I might be like, wow, you wrote a lot of A's. There's an A in cat. Let me show you. I'm going to write cat and, you know, write the letters, sound out the letters and show them, or let's go find some A words in the building. Um, so those are some fun things. Um, yes, Pam, a keyboard can also work as an alternative pencil. Um, it just depends on, you know, the level of your student and kind of where, you know, what, what works best for them. Um, so here's a variety of some other, um, other templates you'll get from the Center for um, Literacy and Disability Studies. So this is an eye gaze one. And so how this one works is you're going to say, okay, I want you to look at the color your letter is. So say my cut letter is green. Um, and then, or, or, oh, sorry. I want you to look at the color that the letter board is, the letter board we're looking at. So say we're looking at the green letter board and then I'm like, okay, what color is your letter? And if I look over here at yellow and go back, it's like L is your letter. So um, you can use um, yes, no head movements. I've got some yes, no switches with a student. I think I, here's, um, let's see how we're doing. I think we're doing okay. Here's a quick video. I've got to share my sound. We have baseball fun. We can't see the video now. I know. You can't see the video? You can't probably hear it. I can, I can hear something, but I can't see anything. All right. Huh. Try sharing again and click sound in. I don't know what I did. I think I lost my Zoom altogether. Well. Oh, there you guys are. Okay. You're still live. We see you. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. All right. Okay. Now I've got to get this thing open here. Boy, I am just really having a day here, aren't I? Okay. Okay, here we go. Can you hear it right now? We have baseball fun, the park, sports, or school. So she's giving her some choices to write about. I like the way you're looking at all of them. Which one do you think you'd like to write about? Show me. Hmm. Park, sports, school, or baseball? Sports. 
So okay. I'm going to tell you she helped right. her there because we they had just one here for they did the video is, again is, um, because they were like, oh, we have to get this video for Heidi. This is so right. awesome. So she had picked baseball you know, the first time. If you look at these time. words and these pictures, would you like an A? A B? A B? Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're using, she looks at her, and that's what she picks. Look. Mm. B is in baseball. Mm. All right, would you like to choose another word? Mm. Would you like an A? A B? Mm. A C? A D? Next page. Would you like an... Oh, would you like this one? Player? All right. Let's get that word on there. Player's got a P, an L, an A. There's our A, Y, E, R. We'll draw a little guy there. Here's our player, and here's our... All right, so that's just a little bit of, um, they had right a enough. definitely yes, no that, that she baseball used. Baseball fun. Um, let's see if it'll go to the next slide, go. Okay, so this video is um, a middle schooler that um, I work with. And so she has a proximity switch on each side of her head and her voice output buttons are either attached under her tray, so they're connected to a voice output button Sometimes they're under her tray. Sometimes they're on top of her tray. Um, but we are, uh, we've done this spin art and she is um, signing her spin art. Do you want an F? Or do you want to say yellow box? Any other letters? Nope. Nope. Do you want a G? Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to put a G. All right. Do you want another G? Yellow Hard pass. Hard pass. All right. Do you want an H? Yellow Yep. All right. Let's put an H. Okay. I'm going to turn the page. Do you want an oh, I already got a no thanks for I. Do you want a J? I see you looking towards that one. I'm going to say that's a hard pass too. Do you want a K? I think you're looking at the camera. Are you trying to get over to that switch? We might need to move them just a hair closer. All right, so that is a little bit about kind of what it looks like in action. Do you want an F? Any questions? I have a question. I know it's not exactly the same, but what about switch users like the student who are using their switches to scan the alphabet on the computer and then select a letter? Is that a next skill or that would um, def or would you think? that would definitely be? I would say a next skill. Um, she's just kind of getting to the point where we're ready to kind of move forward with those things. The other thing, though, is if you're in a hurry. And she's not happened to be set up to with her device or her iPad. Those voice output buttons are quick and easy, and they do not require your staff to have any technology yeah. or, you know, skills. So those are quick and easy. A sub can implement them. Um, you're not having to worry about the interface with the switches. I mean, it's, it's important that they learn that skill with switches. But in a pinch for a quick writing activity, being able to go back to those um, voice out. I'm a total fan of those voice output buttons for so many things, yeah. um, the teaching switch skills. Low tech backup is always a good idea. I yeah. yeah. Okay. So predictable chart writing. Have any of you? Oh, I will show him. It's at the end in the references. I'll show you when we get there. Um, 
So predictable chart writing is that next step of emergent writing, and it's where you start off with, um, they're usually fun, they're easy, they help the students become communicators, um, it provides a consistent daily structure for writing, um, and they can either work as a group or by themselves, and adults model the process, and students actually get to see what authentic writing looks like. It's a week-long process with um, activities for each day. And so this starts with a sentence starter. So this little um, chart was, I put on a, or I put on, um, and then they fixed whether it needed to have an A or not have an A, fix the grammar there. Um, and then write the name of the student next to it who wrote it, because they always get really excited to have their name um, next to that. And so the daily schedule, so day one, you're going to choose a topic of interest um, in the child's knowledge base. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll do some shared reading. Um, so we get some background information and then we'll start um, writing about that, or it could be any topic of their interest or something that they know something about. So you write the chart on the first day and you rewrite that sentence every time for every um, child's um, response and you talk about it as you're rewriting the sentence so they start learning what those words are as well. Um, next you use a pocket chart to build the sentences so you'll have the sentences cut up and you can build them in a um, in a pocket chart they can clap the letters they can clap the words working on teaching them their inner voice to say it in their head um, find a sentence that was yours you can talk about letter concepts, specific letters, word concepts, conventions of reading and writing, like if you need a capital letter or a period. Um, day three, you give them a sentence strip and then they cut up the, they have them read. Their, so at this point, they've heard these sentences multiple, multiple times. So have them try to read their sentence strip. So probably what I would do is I would like read it first and say, okay, now I want you to read it. If they can't speak, let's read it in your head. Um, you know, and you just say, oh, I'm going to read it in my head. I'm going to think, you know, I like frogs um, so that they can start working on that self-talk. And then they cut the sentence strips, cut up the sentence strips. Um, and it doesn't matter where they cut because you're going to have some tape and fix that. Um, you switch adapted scissors are a great way to get your switch users involved in this um, or your kids who really struggle with fine motor skills. Um, it's, it's a great way to kind of get them going. Then they build their sentence. And so that's their work. They're gonna kind of build their sentence and then they glue the words on paper. Day four, you can make little sentence pages they hold or things they wear around their neck. Um, and they get up together and make the sentence together. And you can talk about, oh, that doesn't look, that's, let's read it, let's see if it makes sense. Um, and then day five, they make or publish a book. So Jane Farrell as well, I believe she works at the Durham um, School here, has a predictable chart writing document here that basically is how they teach their team how to use it. And um, this another is another great resource. So something to look at there. And then this is one that um, Brenda Del Monte did with her students. And so they were doing predictable chart writing um, about things they liked, foods that they, they were talking about foods and foods that they liked and they didn't like. Um, and so they can use their AAC to find some of the words. Um, you could be on the food page of your AAC device and they could be picking the words. Um, and then when you're all done, you can publish it. So I'm gonna, hold on, sorry. I'm gonna go to Book Creator, which I have open right here. Um, so Book Creator is an awesome way to publish their books and they're super easy to make. Um, I think there's like a Tuesday tip, or if not, I'll make a Tuesday tip on how to create a, a, a book creator book. Um, so here's their book. We made it a title. 
Um, and then we've got Zayden's, Zayden's page. I like mangoes, but I do not like oranges. I like, you know, and so you, you can have it read it to them. You can share it, get a link so that they can actually take it home and read it with their family. You can print it. Um, they are super easy to make. You can change the backgrounds. And so when you look up a picture, um, a bunch of avocado pictures, if you look up avocados, a bunch of avocado pictures, so they can pick which picture they want and you can start working on row one, row two, row three. But it's a great fun way to publish their book and they are just so excited when it um, reads their page. Um, have any of you used Book Creator? All right, you can try it. But so you do get a free um, teacher account. And I think you get five books and you can combine all your books into like one big book so you can keep making books. Um, but we'll learn more about try it. Try to get try it between now and next time and see what you think. It's pretty intuitive and there's some little tutorials for how to do things. Um, another way to help get that word to, to fill out things is this gentleman is talking about how he feels about things and this is um, an eye gaze board, a low tech eye gaze board. And Brenda's got a video on one of our Tuesday tips about how to use that. Which we're going to not play it here. Um, another fun way to make some crazy, I, I call it crazy writing, but let's see what the spinner says. So you could put letters on the spinner. You could put some of their, you could put their sentence starters on there and it could, um, you know, it could, I mean, their sentence strips, you could put the words in, it could put them and they could decide if it's the right order or not. Um, so just some other um, really great activities on this page. And then what ideas do you guys have for predictable chart writing and how would you, or how have you published um, books? So we do a lot of work with, um, you know, the kids throughout the day, they write paragraphs on typewriter. And some of those follow very predictable patterns and others are more um, open-ended. Uh, oh, great. And right. Shannon makes a paper copy of the book to include in the classroom library. That's awesome. Um, and then they can go back and read their book. Um, that is super fun, super way to get them engaged in reading. Um, immersive Reader is also another uh, resource that can be used. Um, it's a Microsoft yeah. product. Yeah, Immersive Reader is very, very nice to have it read back things. So that is another great tool. You can do them in like a Google slide deck. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of ways to pub or, or a PowerPoint um, as well. You can make books in either of those. So those are some great ideas. Okay, here is the page with the resources. We made it to the end on time. So that was a lot of information. Normally I do the alternative pencil in like a whole hour. So um, Pictello, yes, I forget about Pictello. Um, what we have here is the writing tools continuum that I um, shared earlier. And then this one is her samples. And so it basically goes through what do letters and marks without engagement look like? What does it look like when there's beginning engagement? And again, this goes all the way, um, all the way to that conventional, right? I'm not sure my computer will load it as fast as I'm scrolling a phonetic stage. Um, so a great document to use in your defining like present levels of performance and goal writing and helping you figure out what, what was that really. Um, the other one, let's see if this is, I don't think this is what this was. I might have to mean, no, I did. Oh, the, the one that is making progress, how to, I'll, I'll update the slide deck and I will um, fix the link. So, um, cause it looks like that one 
loaded twice, but there's the, the other one is the next step, how to move to the next step. So I will fix that. Um, this is the site for the finding out more about alternative pencils and predictable chart writing. And with that, any questions? Questions, thought, things you're going to try? I was just thinking, Heidi, um, you're so good at looking at the writing process, not just the tools or the, the technical parts. And I, I think about um, that collaborative process and breaking out of the silos that you talked about. And what a great opportunity for us to maybe start with something like this writing with all tools continuum or the predictable chart writing and partnering with the teacher or if you're a therapist or if you're a teacher partnering with therapists to try to figure out how you can do that kind of a comprehensive lesson where you have you're, you're getting influence on the actual writing process, but you're also providing tools and options on how that student might do that predictable chart writing right low tech mid tech high tech. Um, switches, whatever that is. So I love uh, that comprehensive approach, you know, of, of all the, the collaborative approach. Yeah. Awesome. Says yeah she Jen. can't wait to show her team the joint collaboration document. Oh, I am so excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if you try some stuff, let us know. And again, I will fix, I'll fix that um, link right now. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, I know why, because I'm working on multiple presentations at the same time. Um, and thank yeah, do we say when the next session is? I was just going to double check. Uh, um, let's see. The next session is, is October 25th. So next Tuesday, same day of the week, October 25th will be session two. So please come back and join us. We will record the sessions and I am planning to definitely, I might even break you guys into small groups um, as part of that session. So come back in person because I think we'll have some rich discussion time along with some more resources um, to, to look at. So thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, sorry, sorry to give like so much information, but I felt like getting us started, we really needed to kind of be looking at that developmental continuum. So Heidi did a great um, job laying the foundation.